Good day, folks. It's uh, really great to be here with you again and uh, in this format. And I just want to uh, mention uh, last weekend, I, I took uh, the opportunity of a long weekend here in Alberta, Family Day weekend, to go away and visit some family uh, just a couple hours south of where I live here in, in uh, Redwater. And it was really a great blessing to be able to do that. But it's good to be back in the saddle, so to speak, as we continue uh, our time here, uh, verse by verse in Psalm 119, uh, we're calling this series, The Path to Life. And I want to begin, if, if, I, if you'll allow me, to ask you a couple questions. And the first question is this, do you struggle with doubt? Second question, are you currently struggling with doubt? Maybe doubts about your faith, or doubts about the Word of God itself, or doubts about this, or doubts about that. Do you struggle with doubts? Now, if we're honest with ourselves, the answer would be, of course, I struggle with doubts. We all go through seasons of great or less times of doubt. And we need to be really honest about this for a moment, because when we find ourselves in a season of doubt, it can really shake us up a little bit and sometimes quite a bit, and get right down to our very core. We can become unst unsteady. We, 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 it can trouble us and even muddies up our thoughts and our feelings. Now, Scott Hubbard, who is an editor for DesiringGod.com, shares one such season of doubt in his life that he describes as one of the most difficult challenges to his faith and to the Word of God. And as we consider how doubt seems to come upon us, one wonders what causes these seasons of doubt in our lives that we've all experienced. Let's be honest. It's interesting to note that Hubbard describes that for nearly two decades, and this is his own description, this, as two decades as a nominal Christian, he never doubted the truth of God's word. I'm not quite sure what he meant by that. And then he said it wasn't until his faith what became genuine that he began to uh, have some doubts. And he describes it this way. Uh, this is when he felt the first shadow of doubt. And the event which initiated the doubt in his life was Hubbard's encounter, as he says in his own uh, journey there, a mugger which had left him literally, quote, on the ground bloody and wondering why. Then Hubbard asks this question, where did doubt come from? And why did it pick me? And Hubbard's doubt began to uh, fill him with uncertainty. As was already mentioned, doubt can do that to us. Unwelcome questions began to occupy his mind. Questions like, can scripture really withstand scrutiny? Or, how do you know that God exists? And Hubbard describes this season of doubt in his life in this way, quote, with one mind, I read the Bible, searching for sights of the Lord I loved, and with another mind, I cast a skeptical eye. With one mind, I trusted, with another mind, I doubted. I was, as James says, a double-minded man. That's from James chapter 1, verse 8. So let me ask you again, do you struggle with doubt, or are you currently struggling with doubt? Please turn in your Bible to Psalm uh, 119, verses 113 through to 120. 113 through to 120. Verse 113. I hate the double-minded, but I love your, your law. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Depart from me, you evildoers, that I may keep the commandments of my God. Uphold me according to your promise that I may live. And let me not be put to shame in my hope. Hold me up that I may be safe and have regard for your statutes continually. You spurn all who go astray from your statutes, for, the cunning, for their cunning is in vain. All the wicked of the earth you discard like dross, therefore I love your testimonies. My flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time together. We thank you for blessing us uh, with your presence as well by your spirit. And we ask that uh, your spirit would help us uh, illuminate this text and, and actually uh, inform us not only intellectually, but in our hearts as well. 
as both work together to move to our hands and feet as we go in our day-to-day living as followers of Christ. We thank you, Lord, for all this, and we ask that this time we glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Over the past number of weeks, actually probably over two months, we've been invited into the mind and the heart, if you will, of a person who had an honest and real relationship with God. A person who faced his own trials and tribulations, sometimes with drinks and often in weakness, who faced his own weaknesses and his sin as the Word of God was um, uh, held up to his life like a mirror. As you think about the time that we've traveled through the psalm uh, for a number of weeks now, up to including the stanza for today, these eight verses, we have covered approximately 68% of Psalm 119. And I think we can say with assurance that, that, that God was the psalmist's hiding place, his shield, as he describes here in verse 114. You see, the psalmist's faith was not in some sort of cultural phenomena. It was not a hip thing to do. It was not take it or leave it thing. The psalmist lived his faith, as some might say, on his sleeve for all to see. And it was the word of God that brought the psalmist the hope uh, that he needed when faced with his accusers, as we've found them in the text as well, who spoke ill will, who spoke lies about him. It was hope and life uh, that were there for him to discover in the word of God when facing his persecutors. Why, Bill? Because the word of God for the psalmist was a word from God himself. It was a rich reminder to him of the nature and character of the God he loved and served. And the word of God brought to the mind and the heart and spirit of the psalmist the very promises of God. What a wonderful thing. Promises which are grounded in the goodness and the holiness and the justice and love and righteousness of God, grounded in the one and only eternal God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That God. Not some cultural Christian God, not some fake God, not some false God, the eternal God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So as we consider the text before us, we are reminded today of the chiastic structure of Psalm 119. Now let's just keep it very simple. That's my, that's my principle when we do these things. And say that from verse 113 to verse 120, we recognize a pattern there which where parts of the stanza or parts of these verses mirror each other. Now we won't get to how the structure is laid out for our text. That's for another time, probably not during this sermon series. But what we do want to recognize and notice is that there's a contrast that rises to the surface due to the chiastic structure of this stanza. And it's a contrast between the psalmist and those he refers to here in verse 115 as evildoers. And I think the best way that we can see this contrast is uh, to begin by highlighting key phrases from the text, uh, starting with the psalmist's uh, own words. For example, the psalmist said, I love your law. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. That's verse 113b to 114. I use B and A to separate verses. So if I say B, it's the latter half. If I say half, A, it's the front half. I hope that made sense. The psalmist wanted to keep the commandments of God, verse 115. Now, we've heard this before from the psalmist earlier on in our time in this uh, text. At uh, verse 47, the psalmist said, For I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. And the statement should remind us of what Jesus Uh, hopefully remind us of what Jesus said to his disciples as, as he was drawing closer and closer to his appointment with the Roman cross. He said to his disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 15. You see, obedience to the Lord was key in the psalmist's relationship with God, as it should be for followers of Christ today, as it should be for you and me. Now, this is not perfect obedience. The such thing is that we all fail at points But it is obedience to the Lord, nevertheless, that was key in his relationship with God, as it should be in our relationship with God as well. Well, moving along, uh, the psalmist said, "Uh, Uphold me according to your promise that I may live, verse 116a. Then he said, Hold me up that I may 
be safe, verse 117a. When we think of King David's uh, prayer and hope, he, he said this, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears, Psalm 34, 4. We go to the Apostle Paul in the New Testament and his letter to the believers in Rome, where he highlights the results of the believer's justification by faith in Christ. He said, to the Roman believers, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 5, 1. You see, for the apostle, uh, faith in the work of Christ on the cross revealed the full measure of God's grace and hope. That even as the uh, Roman believers were experiencing their own trials and tribulations in their own time, gr the grace and hope of God in Christ would produce what Paul called endurance. And then endurance, Paul would say, produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our heart through the Holy Spirit who has, given us, who has been given to us. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. That's quite amazing if you think about it. That this grace and hope in God, the faithful in Rome, experienced in their sufferings for their faith in Christ, the psalmist experienced in his context many, many years before, as he proclaimed here in verse 119b, Therefore I love your testimony. Testimonies. So in summary, the psalmist, as one commentator put it so well, quote, responds to his God in spirit and body. His life of obedience is lived in the presence of the living God. Or as the psalmist prayed, as we read that prayer together, he prayed to God, you are my hiding place and my shield, I hope in your word. And this is verse 114. And I think we can only speculate, and I like to speculate at this time, but in the annals of human history, this godly psalmist before us in this text could say along with the Apostle Paul, absolutely, without any qualms, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. And that's what Paul said to his friend Timothy in 2 Timothy verse 4, and for, uh, chapter 4, verse 7. Well, moving on, the contrast continues. Next, we describe the contrast between the psalmist and now the evildoers of verse 115. And we want to just do a quick little rabbit trail or excursus, if you will, when we look at the life and times of David here for a moment, King David, as described in the Bible, I think we can understand that he had his fair share of trials and tribulations. Some of them were a result, of course, of his own sinful decisions and some from outside of his control. But King David knew what it was like to be on the receiving end of evildoers. He knew what it was like to be put to shame, to be slandered, to be falsely accused, to be lied about, to be surrounded even by false prophets, and, and even experience persecution from his own family. And we see what the impact of these kinds of things on King David were in many of his psalms. We find King David often praying and pleading, often in tears, that Yahweh would be his refuge, or as the psalmist put it here, his shield, his hiding place. And like the psalmist of our text, David could pray, Depart from me, all your workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. You find that in Psalm verse 6, verse, Psalm, verse, uh, Psalm 6, verse 8 to 10. Pardon me, I'm kind of mumbling my references there. I apologize. So what can we learn about the evildoers in our context, or in this text, if you will? Well, I want to start by uncovering a meaning of a Hebrew verb. The Hebrew verb is rawa, ra'a. Probably not saying that right, you Hebrew scholars out there. But it's translated by the ESV, ESV here as evildoers. The sense here is of someone who does evil deliberately, who does evil deliberately. These are the people that King David revealed to us in his prayer, which I just shared a moment ago, workers of evil, Psalm 6, verse 8. These are those people who stand out in contrast to the psalmist who responded to God in spirit and body by living a life of obedience in the presence of God. These are those people in our text, as someone once said, quote, act as though God does not see or care. Again, we turn, we return to Jesus, and uh, this time to his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel, 
to help us build a picture of the evildoers that the psalmist contrasts here in his text or in our text. We go to chapter 7 of Matthew, and there Jesus, we find, warns his disciples and anyone who cared really to listen to beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Matthew 7, 15. Of course, Jesus was speaking into his context regarding the religious leaders of Israel who had manipulated and distorted the law and the commandments of God into a works righteousness. It was really a Ponzi scheme where the Pharisees, the scribes, and the teachers, these ruling uh, authorities over Israel, were at the top of the pyramid, which they built on their treachery and lies, disguised, as Jesus said, in sheep's clothing. Yet Jesus describes how one can discern the true heart of an evildoer. When he said, you will recognize them by their fruits. That's Matthew 7, verse 16. Then Jesus goes on to describe the difference between a healthy tree that can only produce good fruit and a diseased tree that can only produce bad fruit. There Jesus is using a word picture or a metaphor, if you will, to reveal that one can recognize an evildoer by the bad fruit that they produce. Matthew 7:17. 7, then Jesus, using the language of judgment, said that every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Matthew chapter 7, verse 19. Keeping this in mind, we go back to our text. The psalmist described the, evil, the characteristics of evildoers for us here in the text. In essence, what the psalmist has done is to provide a short list of the kind of fruit that a diseased tree produces that Jesus spoke of in his sermon. And it begins here at verse 113, where the psalmist describes the evildoers as double-minded. They were double-minded. And here the meaning of the original Hebrew speaks of someone who's divided in heart and mind. And this could manifest in a number of ways, and one of those would be someone who is disloyal, for example. A person who deserts a leader or cause or a principle, according to um, the dictionary, Bible dictionary. One such person comes to mind, if you think about it, Judas Iscariot, who gave up Jesus to the authorities for a few pieces of silver. We see also in the history of, it, of Israel, we see a nation displaying a double mind as a nation. We think of Elijah the prophet when facing off against the prophets of Baal, who challenged Israel with these words. Elijah said, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. You find that in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. We go back approximately 500 years, over 500 years, to the time of Joshua. There we find him challenging Israel in a similar way, where Joshua said, Choose this day whom you will serve, whether it be the gods of your fathers served, or the gods of the Amorites. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, Joshua 24, verse 15. Now, we're going to come back to this term, uh, double-minded, shortly. But we go from there, and we see next that the evildoers are cunning. Evildoers are cunning. We see this in verse 118. Friends, this describes someone who is deceptive, who is deceitful, who is dishonest. And the question is, where does this dishonesty, this, decept this deceitfulness, this uh, deceptiveness come from? Where does it originate? Well, I think Jeremiah the prophet put his finger on it when describing the sin of Judah. Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful, but deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Jeremiah 17, 9. We go back to Jesus addressing the Jews concerning the heart, the very essence of who we are. Jesus said, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth this defiles a person, Matthew 15, 10. Well, the context here is Jesus was talking about the, Fisera, the traditions of the elders. The Pharisees had demanded these traditions of the elders, washing their hands before the meal, which, my friends, was never in the law of God. Then Jesus would say, how is this possible? No, I am saying, according to me, how is this possible? Then what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. That's what Jesus would say. It's possible because it proceeds from the heart. Matthew 15, 18. Then Jesus, in that very same text, provided an incomplete list 
of what comes from the heart. And I call it incomplete because he could have made it really, really, really long. But he said this, from what? What comes from the heart, evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual morality, which covers so many things, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. Matthew 15, 19 and 20. So the origin of the evildoer's cunning is in their hearts. The next characteristic of an evildoer, according to the text, is that all go astray from your statutes. That's what the psalmist said in verse 8, 118. So these are the people, as the commentator said, quote, act as though God does not see or care. The Apostle Paul puts his finger on it when he said to his dear friend and pastor concerning these kinds of people, he said this to Timothy, they have the appearance of godliness, but denying its powder, avoid such people. 2 Timothy verse, chapter 3, verse 5. You see, friends, evildoers had gone astray from the truth of the word of God. Well, the list has been completed in our text here. It is short, but it provides a complete picture of the evildoers. They're double-minded, they're cunning, they appear as godly, they parted from the word of God and acting as though God does not see or care. And I think we can summarize this best, even better, uh, best by what the Apostle Paul exhorts to the Roman church in Romans chapter 3 about the condition of all human hearts. No, none are righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You find that in Romans chapter 3, verse 10 and 11, and verse 23. So here, my friends, the contrast is complete. We have the psalmist who responds by faith with a life of obedience, lived in the presence of God. And we have the wicked of the earth of verse 119, then and today who act as though God does not see or care. And here's the question. The question that you and I are faced with and comes to mind to me to share with you. Where do you see yourself? Because you see, your answer to that question is not only important, it is a matter of life and death. And this brings us back, as promised, to verse 113, where the psalmist described the wicked as double-minded. Now, if you have any idea at all, you probably do. James, in his letter in the New Testament, spoke in such language. James, in his letter, writes to encourage believers who are facing what he said, what he calls trials of various kinds in James chapter 1, verse 2. And he goes on to remind them that testing of their faith would produce steadfastness, for, uh, verse 3, same chapter. And he went on to say that anyone who needed it, they could ask God for wisdom in their situation, and God, who is full of generosity, will provide the wisdom. And then he goes on to say that when asking for God's wisdom, the believers were to ask in faith with no doubting, he says, chapter 1, verse 6. For the one who doubts is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways, chapter 1, verse 8. I think this, this, this reminds us in part of what the psalmist said about evildoers. Their trust was not in God, but in themselves. So does this mean that if you and I, as followers of Christ, have doubts, that God looks down on us with displeasure, that God won't answer our prayers, that God won't forgive our sins? Well, if this were the case, God Hubbard, in his time of doubt, would have reached a different conclusion other than trusting Christ. Blogger Derek DeMars, commenting on James, goes as far as to suggest that we often take doubt to mean that we must force ourselves to will away any doubt or unbelief. He calls this silly because it turns all our prayers into some sort of self-help effort. Frankly, my friends, if we believe James means that our doubts brings God's displeasure, that he will not forgive us of our sins, we have taken, we have taken James out of context. When we take all of the letter as a whole, especially chapter 4 and chapter 2 together, we can find the question is not a doubt, but of trust. We all have doubts that come our way. The question is, where is your loyalty? Where is your loyalty? If you're double-minded, your heart and mind are divided, and your loyalty to God then could be in question. My friends, it's in the valley of doubt that we need to be like the psalmist who loved the word of God who had a biblically grounded fear of God, who trusted the promise of God because he placed his faith, he placed his trust in the God who had revealed himself in the word of God. 
My friends, uh, we all are born into this world with a sin nature. Not uh, contrary to some uh, teachers today in Christianity or in modern day evangelicalism that teach that we uh, uh, can attain no sin, uh, uh, that would not be biblical. We are born, as Paul said, all with sin fall short of the glory of God. And we need someone to do something about it. And someone did that. God has done that for us. God sent his one and only son into the world that anyone that would believe in him, anyone that would believe in him would have their sins forgiven and receive eternal life. The gospel is not complicated. And what uh, I, I would appeal to you, if you're in a season of doubt, this is where the, 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 the work can be done where you will learn that God can be trusted, that his word is true, that even in your doubt, he's walking with you, even maybe even carrying you and even leading you. And for those of you who are hearing this message that are not followers of Christ, where you have questions, God is good all the time. And all you need to do is reach out to him and ask him to grant you repentance unto salvation. And God will respond to your prayer. That is my hope and prayer for you. So let us pray now. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit who has convicts us of our sin and who, had, who even when we can't pray, when we are in those valleys of doubt that and we can't even pray without assurance, we know that you, the Holy Spirit, prays for us. We are sinners. That is the bearing uh, that we have to carry. That's something we have to carry the rest of our lives. But thanks be to God that you have sent your one and only Son into this world, Lord, to forgive us of our sins and redeem us and be our substitution, our substitute on the, on, on the cross, where, where God exchanged, where your Son exchanged his, his righteousness for our sin. We thank you, Lord, for these things. I pray for my friends and those who are listening, that you would bless them and grant them repentance unto salvation. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for having me in your places. God bless. Shalom.